Hi, I'm Roman Polanski and I directed this motion picture and now I'm going to talk about it for those who are interested to hear. It's a bit strange to be seated in my office and watching the film that I've done almost a year ago. I usually don't go back to uh, my films unless I'm compelled to like now. I hope you don't hear those birds twitting behind the window and occasional cars passing which may um, disrupt this commentary. So this guy sitting behind the desk playing Telfer is uh, a production designer with whom I made a film called The Bitter Moon and uh, I thought he was a perfect, um, had perfect physique to play this character. And I asked him whether he wouldn't make his uh, acting debut as the, at the sweet age of 70 or something. And he was delighted. And I think he did quite a good job. That stool that you saw, it was fun, actually. That scene was more or less improvised as far as the camera movements are concerned. And I thought it would be funny to show that stool and have the audience uh, wondering why I'm showing them the stool. But uh, the pan up to the uh, chord explains it all. These are not actually the production designer's feet that you see jerking. It was uh, uh, my assistant who we hung on the harness to do that bit because the guy was a little bit too old to do this. And uh, that shot, that long shot that you're seeing now, was quite complicated because of the camera movement. And uh, if we did not have uh, the um, actual technology to help us to smooth it out uh, later, it would be much more jerky. Who knows, maybe it would be better. But that um, this stage of uh, my filmmaking, I like trying to be perfect, which never works, of course. So the titles, that's how I always imagined them, but uh, to make it work was a different business. It took weeks of uh, work on the computer to get these gates combined with the names and have this movement through the gates. The actual gates themselves was, were shot during our um, location um, shoot in Toledo. Toledo is a beautiful city and has all those fantastic Renaissance or Baroque churches. And uh, the last day of shooting, I just gathered our crew quickly because I realized that I will be needing these gates and we ran from church to church from monastery to monastery shooting these gates. It was really a, a, a chase and the last one was shot at the end of the day and we hardly had any exposure. But we got it and I think it functions actually. It's one of those sequences that uh, put you in the right mood to watch what you're going to see. Club Dumas is the title of the book on which the movie was based. Uh, I changed the title to The Ninth Gate because the novel is quite complex and it has a couple of plots. One of them is about the lost um, chapter of um, Three Musketeers and that's why the book is called The Club Dumas. But in the movie you need to be more more uh, linear, so we uh, dropped that second plot and concentrated on the on the story of the book. Uh, El Club Dumas is, however, a great novel, and I think those who are interested in the origins of this picture, I would uh, suggest they read and they check it because it's it's a good. Uh, suspense and f quite uh, mm, interesting 
descriptions of uh, various uh, um, parts of Europe. That shot which follows. The pan of a Manhattan skyline is, of course, the second unit shot. And it was integrated into these titles uh, later, of course. It's an impressive collection. You have some very rare editions here. Are you sure you want to sell them all? They're no use to father, not anymore. So the apartment, of course, what you see behind the window, <clears throat> um, it's a backing. And the um, shirt was made in a French apartment. If you take this backing away, you would see a garden, actually. And uh, uh, we used this apartment because it looked to me very much like a, a, a Manhattan interior. Uh, there were no books, naturally, and it was totally redecorated by Dean Tavularis. For those uh, who don't know who Dean Tavularis is, I'll remind you, he did all Godfather movies, and I think he's one of the best... Uh, um, production designers around and he had a terrific crew with him a French guy named Philippe Turlure who got all those paintings that you can see here and uh, the books of course masses and masses of books for other interiors that you see in other parts of the film none of the libraries that you are going to see really exists it's either a studio or some other house that has been refurbished to uh, suit the scene, in the particular scene in the picture. This couple of actors are Americans. The paralyzed guy is, is a French theatrical actor. He's quite a... Um, big here in France, but he was delighted to do that little cameo. And that guy uh, that comes out of the elevator, it's uh, an American actor, Alan Garfield, and he arrived with half of his face paralyzed, as you can see it here. And I thought it was funny for the character, but uh, just before that, we have a guy in a wheelchair, so it looked like we're making a film about paralytics, really. But uh, it was too late to do anything about it. That quick shot of the street, um, it's of course the studio. And this interior is built, and again, Philippe Turlure stuck all those uh, books inside, and you may be. You may lose the illusion that the film provides if I tell you that it's just. Uh, one of French film studios and the street doesn't really exist outside. Sure. And he said your evaluation was way over the top. Got those people coming out in a rash. Now those books are, of course, real books and uh, quite uh, expensive. So uh, we had to be very careful because there are some extremely... Uh, expensive volumes like this one for example this is uh, Don, Hi Don Quixote Ibarra edition one of the first Spanish editions of Don Quixote and that uh, uh, goes without saying it's uh, a very pricely possession of uh, one of the people that I um, knew who was kind enough to lend it to us. The Swiss was my client. No deal. Fifteen for my children's sake. You don't have any children. I'm still young. Give me time. Ten. This building again is one of Parisian um, high rises, but it wasn't high enough for New York, so we doubled the the size of it uh, electronically. Uh, now, I think I should talk about Johnny Depp a little bit. Uh, Johnny Depp was my first choice for the film uh, because he, he 
his physique relates very much to the character in the book. Uh, uh, the age was a bit of a problem. I thought he was a bit too young to play a part, and I asked him, how can we make him look old? And he said that the only thing that gives him age is if he grows a, a beard. You can hardly call it a beard, but it did the trick. And I think that's the first time that Johnny looks like an adult, really, because he's got this uh, teenager's looks about him, which are very attractive, but they were not right for, for Corso in this film. the medium of a pact with the devil. To assist them in their work... And uh, Frank Langella, uh, that's again how I imagined the character right from the start, and Frank was also my first choice. I thought somehow of Sidney Greenstreet, even if physically or voice-wise he's not like Sidney Greenstreet, but he's got some kind of uh, threatening humor that uh, um, I wanted for this part. I see you were stimulated by my little talk, Mr. Corso. Johnny played this part somehow straight and flat, and that wasn't at the beginning the way I, I was imagining um, Corso, but after a couple of days I thought that gives the film some different aspect that I was not anticipating when I was working on the script, and I decided to let him uh, play this way and and I think that's uh, 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 an interesting contrast with all those uh, strange um, and funny secondary characters around him. When we were doing this scene, Frank Langella asked me what number should he punch on this? Uh, board and I said let's have 666 and uh, I didn't expect that some people pick it up uh, but uh, some do <laughs> because I was asked already about it uh, uh, it seems that like the Frank Langella and, uh, and Johnny hit it right from the start there was some real what you call in Hollywood jargon had chemistry between them and they enjoyed this antagonistic relationship on the set. <clears throat> this is studio, of course, uh, Balkan's library, and that painting behind, or rather photograph, it's naturally the castle that we see at the end of the picture. Here again, Frank Langella is going to patch 666. The New York behind the bay windows is again backing, lit from behind. It called, it's called Translight, and that functions very well. Not to mention the centuries of wisdom. Against those books are all... Uh, some of them the same books that you have seen in the first scene uh, with the, the additions of more expensive and rare uh, volumes. We needed many more here and had to be uh, more uh, uh, lavish looking. Naturally, we animated a little bit these backing behind. Some lights go on, others go off. Some uh, airplanes passing. Neon signs flashing. Cars, etc. to give it some life. But it's all studio. As, I, as they say, all done with mirrors. Well, three are known. That's the trouble. Where'd you get it? I bought it from Telfer. 
Topher? Yes, he finally sold it to me the day before he killed himself. <laughs> it's good timing. Before we started the film, we did a couple of weeks of rehearsals, mainly for Frank Langella and, and uh, Johnny for this scene, because this is one of the few long dialogue scenes, and uh, the rest was really difficult to rehearse because scenes are so short, and there is more action than uh, dialogue in it. Jokia actually acquired it. The engravings you're now admiring were adapted by Tokyo from the... Delta. Now, the book, the actual prop, it took a lot of efforts to make a book that would look authentic enough. Inside information, they're reputed to conjure up the Prince of Darkness in person. You don't say. Are you a religion? We had to find the right paper, right uh, typeface, and... Uh, those illustrations, of course. Uh, the original um, book had illustrations made by um, a Spanish graphic artist, and I asked him to redo those for us, and uh, uh, I think he did a good job, but it took awfully long, back and forth, because we had to have some similarity be between certain characters in those engravings and characters in the movie. And they had to be incorporated in such a way that it's discreet enough not to look phony. But the book in se itself, the prop itself, I'm quite proud of because if you take it in your hand, you won't really believe that it's uh, not an authentic book. It's done with so much care and detail that it really looks like 17th century volume. If all three copies turn out to be bogus or incomplete, your work will be done. If, on the other hand, one of them turns out to be genuine, I'll finance you further. I want you to get it for me, at all costs, never mind how. Never mind how sounds illegal. Wouldn't be the first time you've done something illegal. Not that illegal. The uh, novel of um, El Club Dumas it's so complex and um, convoluted and has such a number of secondary characters that at the first glance it looks um, it looks uh, unadaptable for, for, for movie purposes. And uh, uh, the uh, a Spanish co-producer had a couple of... Uh, Writers that had a crack on it, at it and uh, it didn't work. And send, he sent me one of the first drafts and I read it. I didn't know the, the, the novel yet. I read this uh, first attempt and I found it very, uh, very exciting. And I decided to read the novel and I knew then that I wanted to make a film from it. So I sat down with John Brown, John, and... Uh, started rewriting this first draft um, and it took us about a year to come to what the film is now. You can see the grain on, of, of the paper and the print. It really looks like an authentic illustration of the period. Lena Olin was sexy and sophisticated enough to play this ambiguous role of a, a woman who is uh, leading a sort of a coven she had to be um, attractive, uh, sexy, and at the same time she had to have a, um, the right age of a person who could be involved in this type of activity and who could have certain authority uh, among the, the members of that coven. Isn't this one of my husband's books? Right. It was in his collection until very recently. He sold it to a client of mine. I'm trying to authenticate it. He sold it, you say? How strange. This was one There is no relation to any sort, sort of reality in, uh, in this movie. It's all uh, uh, fantasy and uh, uh, it's uh, closer to a, some kind of fairy tale for adults than uh, history. I'm tracking them down, yes. 
You're a book detective. Kind of. Do you recall when and where your husband acquired this book? In Spain. We were vacationing at Toledo. I admire very much the work of uh, Darius Conch in this scene. I think he managed to get the, the mixture of realism with mystery. Uh, the interiors look uh, um, real, and at the same time there's some kind of weird atmosphere in, in every shot. This one, when they enter the uh, library of the uh, man of, who hanged himself at the beginning, Telfa, Liana's husband, the uh, uh, slight fog and backlight, it was shot in the suburb of Paris, in a villa which was owned by Americans and very much in the style of one of those uh, homes that you see uh, not far from New York. Um, and uh, naturally, um, books were added. It is a library, but not... Uh, in the same style, there are no antique books there. Whatever he was up to, I certainly can't see him chanting mumbo-jumbo or trying to raise the dead. The devil, Mrs. Telfer. This book is designed to raise the devil. Maybe I should talk a little bit about costumes in this film, which were made by uh, Anthony Powell. I made a few films with him. Tess, uh, among other things, for which he got an Oscar. One of the Oscars he had in his career. And we wanted to get this sort of um, unspecific look for most of the characters, particularly for Corso. Uh, I didn't want any, anything concrete uh, and that anything that could be read as a concrete period or concrete place. And also I wanted him to look a bit shabby, a man who is not really very interested in his looks. Uh, he's not even interested in... Um, making he, the place where he lives interesting. It just should be all um, anonymous. Same with the girl. I wanted her to look like some hitchhiker, but at the same time I wanted her to have some uh, mysterious aspect, sometimes diabolical, sometimes angelical. We put glasses on Johnny Depp's face, of course. That was not to give him age, although it helps. It was to give him slightly studious look of a, a bookworm. Uh, he, the guy who's doing this job m must have some passion for books. And that, of course, helped. And it helps us with several scenes in the film. Um, this reference library was shot at the um, at the university building in Paris. It is a real library, of course. Uh, however, we placed the bookshelves a different way, so we could have this face-to-face uh, um, -face encounter uh, through the hall between books. This street here, it's again, again studio. Um, it may be disappointing to some. I much prefer to shoot in the studio if I can help it. I have much more control and peace. 
then on the street where you have a bunch of onlookers and police and cars and people irritated because they can't uh, pass the way uh, they're used to. So naturally, it was better to do it in a studio. We could find in Paris, of course, streets that would be suitable, but why bother? Corso's apartment is studio as well, of course. I like this shot which starts on the inside of the book and ends up with two profiles and people walking behind the window. Uh, I, again, I like Darius Conge's lighting here. I like the um, opposition of cold and warm light, the cold light coming from the street behind and above and warm light of the lamps inside. It gives a, the atmosphere and the a relief to, to the faces. Because I'm starting to see things. Like what? Uninvited visitors, unfamiliar faces. I don't trust anyone, not even Balkan. Come to think of it, I'm not even sure. I like the atmosphere of all these interiors because I like books. I like them as objects, and I like very much what's inside them. Um, particularly now when they um, uh, have such serious competitor as the computer, it's a good thing to make a movie about a book. This is blue screen, of course. Uh, the, what you see behind the window was... Uh, put in afterwards. I like the supernatural uh, part of the book and that was one of the attractions and reason for which I made this movie. Devil is a good protagonist for films, plays, books. Uh, I, I'm not the a believer myself and I have a hard time to talk about devil without humor or irony but I must say um, uh, he's a good guy to make a film about even if you don't see him I've come to talk business mm -hmm. yesterday when you came to see me about that book I was too surprised. I've been, of course, asked many questions about Rosemary's Baby with regard to this film because uh, that it dealt with the devil as well. But Rosemary's Baby was an adaptation of a book which is serious about the devil, and I had a hard time, I must say, uh, to be serious about it. That's why in Rosemary's Baby I never uh, did any supernatural hints it could be all interpreted in the final analysis as some kind of a new roses uh, on, on the part of Rosemary. It can be said that she has uh, uh, imagined it's all figment of, her, of the imagination of pregnant woman. Whereas here, I did not need that because the, the whole film is not very uh, serious. It has, it's a bit of a, um, I wouldn't say parody, but uh, it, it, it relates somehow to the genre and, and makes a bit of a fun of the detective genre and, uh, and supernatural genre. It mixes those two together. On, on this scene between um, Liana and Corso when she comes to um, talk him into uh, selling her the book, uh, 
uh, has all aspects of this. Uh, um Hamet or Raymond Chandler uh, scenes where the femme fatale is trying to con the uh, the uh, hero into some kind of uh, um, action which is disloyal to his employer and it ends like it often ends in this type of book by uh, the detective being hit on the head and losing his consciousness I love that trick when the character awakes to something new and that's this romanticism of uh, uh, of these detective novels Okay, where is it? Where's what? Don't fuck with me! I thought I already did. Ow! We had a lot of fun actually shooting this scene when he stumbles with his pants around his ankles and uh, Johnny was enjoying it tremendously. He did a very good job, very good acting with his feet. That bit was difficult to get this blood coming on cue and being discreet enough and yet noticeable. I didn't want any ketchup splashing over his glasses. I just wanted one drop to slowly go down. Once again, the studio here it was all shot in a studio called Epinay, which is about 10 kilometers from Paris. Working in France on an English-speaking motion picture requires really speaking in English, basically, except uh, when you talk to the electricians and uh, grips who don't speak English or, or little, uh, you have to then uh, go back to French. So sometimes uh, I don't even know what language I'm, I, I'm using and I catch myself speaking English to a French guy who doesn't understand a thing and vice versa, talking to uh, an American actor in French who, who suddenly answers, oui, 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 Roman, oui, oui, oui. And I realize he's making fun of me, and of course I switch back to English again. This guy hanging by, by a foot was of course a stuntman who looked very much like uh, the actor. And he hung the, through a take and always a little bit before the take, so I would say each time uh, we hung him for like two or three minutes with his head down. I would hate to do this job. Prefer directing. It's a blue screen, of course, and uh, the, uh, the this close-up of Johnny has the uh, plate behind a little bit too big. The car's a little bit too big. That's why it, it doesn't look right. But what makes it attractive is the reflection in his glasses. 
This looks good on the other hand. Stop. Stop at that phone booth. Pull over. No problem, sir. I like very much scenes in the, in the phone booth when someone is sweating and the person um, on the other end of the wire uh, is at ease or uh, threatening or let uh, himself um, being begged or, or, or scenes where the character has to wait for an answer. Uh, these are all cliches that um, anyone who loves movies enjoys, and I do love them, so I enjoy both watching and, and shooting scenes like this. I mean, I quit. I want to return the book. Where are you? Well, this is different. Remember Bernie One was... thing about Frank Langella yeah. that suit me a lot was his voice, since he exists in a film on the telephone mostly. The voice was tremendously important. It's a rich and beautiful voice, and at the same time, ominous and threatening. Hey, where are you? Balkan? Balkan? I do very little research before the movie, except uh, when I deal with period or uh, some kind of uh, profession that requires specific knowledge. Um, but here, for example, in this film, I hardly made any res research at all, except naturally we had to know uh, more about the books of the time, about the illustrations, methods of printing, etc. Now this scene with two brothers it's of course uh, um, made on the, uh, with the same actor playing each scene twice. So you use for this purpose a device which is called mo uh, motion control. Uh, it allows you to repeat uh, the camera movements like the pan that, that we just saw and you shoot it with the, with, with the actor, then he goes to be remade up, and uh, you change his costume, and he comes back and plays the other actor. And this guy is not an actor on top of everything. I could not find a, a Spanish actor who would uh, speak English good enough, and he would be, who would be suitable for this character, and he would be good enough. And I was watching our production manager, a Spanish production manager who speaks excellent language, excellent English, sorry. Because he used to be uh, an assistant director and, and worked with great American filmmakers for years and years. And I said, one day you're gonna play the part and he ran away from the office. And we, <laughs> we had to work on him for like two or three months to convince him to, uh, to have a try, to have a go at it. And eventually he did. And uh, first thing we shaved his hair, then we glued this mustache on him that sometimes looks a bit phony actually in the close-ups. And, uh, and there he learned his lines and I think he did a terrific job considering it's never been in front of the camera before. Printing, the binding, a magnificent example of 17th century Venetian craftsmanship. Finest rough paper, resistant to the passage of time. I didn't even try to look for real twins uh, 
I, I had a hard time to find a Spanish actor who played a part, let alone uh, an actor who would have a twin brother. So uh, it was from the start decided that we're going to um, use the uh, today's technology to, uh, to do this scene. It seems to say, and danger will descend on you from above. This type of books often contain the... This is really a special effect. Like the one that you're going to see in a moment with the scaffolding falling on uh, on Johnny or behind him. Those drawings are very much like the tarot cards, of course modified and made into book illustrations. These, they are made like woodcuts and we're cheating a little bit because in 17th century most of the illustrations were actually etching, copper etchings rather than woodcuts. And this is something in between, but it looks authentic enough for the purpose of the motion picture. So uh, I thought I would stick to this concept and, and that's how they were made. <laughs> this uh, uh, scaffolding uh, falling down was of course a dangerous business so we did not have it fall as Johnny ran in front of it we had we used again uh, this method when you shoot the scene twice and then combine it so we had Johnny to run first and then uh, without moving camera we shot the um, the scaffolding disintegrating I think today's technology gives us great opportunity. It's a tool for a, uh, for, for, for a filmmaker. And it all depends how they are used. If they are used only for the sake of impressing with, with the effect, it's sometimes very gratuitous. Gratuitous, sorry. And, uh, well, I'm in a French office here, and you'll forgive me if sometimes my English is a bit Frenchy, but... Uh, that's the way it goes. I use a lot of this technology. In this film, there are hundreds of special effects that you can hardly see it. Not only so obvious, as obvious as this falling scaffolding, but this train, for example, here. Uh, everything that ha happens behind the window, the train passing behind, and the lights that you can see moving, it was added afterwards. The effect on her face uh, was shot naturally uh, with the light behind the window, but the little uh, lamps passing, crossing were added later. I thought Emmanuel had great looks for this role. Uh, she has this bit angelic and wicked look at the same time. And uh, uh, she can be very en enigmatic and that's what we needed for, for this character. And I told her to not to really uh, search much, but just say the lines ordinarily as though she would be saying it in life. Uh, I did not ask her to do anything particularly mysterious or, 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 or strange. I wanted her to um, make it look as though she was a real um, a hitchhiker or one of those girls that just likes traveling because the situation itself uh, makes it all suspicious her presence in the film is very suspicious so there's no need to act it out and to make sure we get it and that's how she delivered the role flat also like johnny 
Now we in Sintra. Uh, it's a place in Portugal, which was very popular spot in 19th century. And a lot of famous artists, poets, including Byron, uh, used to go to this place. And it has a, a microclimate. It's always foggy and, and, and cold. Whereas the, the rest of Portugal is, of course, uh, very hot and uh, has an entirely different climate. And this, uh, this house, uh, it's so elegant and so uh, manicured, we had to uh, make it look like a ruin. And I, I'm glad that the owners who uh, rented us the house for the purpose of shooting were uh, away because if they have seen what we've done to it, they would probably have a heart attack. But we restored it, of course. And uh, I, I hope they found it in, uh, in the state they left it to us. Home, sweet home. You uh, won't say no to Brandy, I take it. Thank you very much. The interior of this house has to be bare and abandoned because uh, Fargas is, uh, is an aristocrat who, um, who's got no money and, uh, and the house ha had to have traces of former splendor, but it's, it's supposed to be completely decrepit because he's got, he lives only from selling his books and in his dialogue he explains it a bit. He says that uh, old families uh, wither and die. But Peter, you didn't see them in better times. I used to have 5,000. But these are the survivors. So this is the Fargus collection. Not quite as I imagined it, I must say. Tel Aviv, my friend. But I keep them in perfect condition, safe from damp light. To find this, uh, this house and other locations took tremendous amount of time. Um, I have first uh, scouts who know what we are looking for, who um, go to look for places and take pictures and videos. And then when we find something that really... Um, uh, pleases us, we go uh, ourselves. We, I mean uh, the uh, production designer, which in this case was Dean Tavularis, myself, and the, the uh, director of photography. And then we decide whether, w which one we are going to use, and that takes months. It might have been printed yesterday. Is it in order? I mean, you haven't detected anything unusual. No, the text is complete, the engraving... Preparation of this picture took about eight months. And uh, we had some 15 weeks of shoot, more or less. And the post-production was very long because all those uh, special effects, even if they are discreet, uh, take a long time to, uh, to complete. It's, uh, it's strange that he should have sent you here if he already had... Uh, you have it here? May I see it? This type of a house in Portugal, this sort of a rich aristocratic family uh, home is called Quinta. And uh, for the um, economical reasons, we were trying to find it in Spain because most of our shooting, uh, most of our location shooting was in Spain. And there was just no way of finding anything that would be remotely possible for this. 
So suddenly we decided to jump on a plane and go to um, go to Sintra, where the this part of the book actually takes place. And uh, as we got out of a car, I just looked around and said, "Let's have a look at that house." And that was it. It was the first thing. Uh, that I indicated, and uh, uh, it was perfect. So sometimes, indeed, it takes so long to find the right location, and sometimes one gets lucky, and it's at the first shot. Making film in, in Europe or in America is mainly the same type of effort. Uh, maybe money is different, uh, but the uh, people you have around you are, are practically the same. You can find really good technicians in France, Italy, England, and uh, um, very, very motivated. I like working in Europe, I must say. Um, uh, the machinery studio um, operation, it's of course fantastic. Uh, everything is done uh, to help the filmmaker. We don't have it here to such an extent, but very often it's compensated by the interest of people involved and by the enthusiasm and sheer passion for, uh, for what they're doing. As I said before, I like movies, so of course I like genres. And uh, I like this type of film, um, a sort of suspense, detective, all those kinds of flicks I, I, I go to see. Uh, wherever I have an opportunity. And naturally, if I like to see this type of uh, movies, I like making them as well. And I like those uh, scenes where you can create atmosphere just by lighting and camera movement. And that film required long shots and a specific pace, which is not very fashionable now. But... Uh, um, I, uh, I must say I'm a bit nauseating by uh, today's fashion of extremely quick cuts and overuse of close-ups. Very often you don't know what's going on in the scene because it's just a bunch of close-ups um, spaced together. So uh, uh, this one is a little bit of a reaction against it. The editor of this film is Hervé Deleuze. I made already several films with him. Um, he started actually as an assistant on my film Tess. Since then he made masses of films. Uh, we work using Avid, of course, which is the virtual editing. And that machine gives us also endless possibilities because everything is recorded it's simply a computer and uh, uh, every version that you did stays so you can compare the new version of a scene with something that you've done days or months ago uh, it's a great tool but uh, uh, it takes a long time because you have uh, a temptation to check what you've done before, to compare and to fiddle with it endlessly. But the results are uh, fantastic. I like books. Do you? <laughs> you been traveling long? A while. Mm -hmm. Don't suppose you ever traveled by motor? Excuse me, senor. Telephone, senor. I can understand a certain 
directors abhor this uh, avid uh, tool um, for, set, for, for some reasons which I also stayed away from it uh, for, for some time and that is that the time that you um, spend of sort of medial work of gluing film together or waiting for your assistant to come up with 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 the right piece of film uh, is not time lost because your head works during those moments and even uh, if there is not much progress on the screen of your uh, um, of your moviola uh, there is progress in head your head works very well when you have to wait for something uh, when you wait in the dentist's uh, waiting room or under the shower, you sometimes come with fantastic yeah, brainstorms. Always open in one copy and bricked up in the other. And there's another thing. Yes. Yes, go on. The ones that differ aren't signed Torquia. They're signed LCF. You still there? LCF. Listen, where are you anyway? I must have that copy, Mr. Corso. Get it for me. The old man wouldn't sell it to save his life. He said as much. Did he? There's Hello. a great thing about this avid. It's that Hello. it allows you in, in immediate access to, to, to any take, any part of the film that you shot. And you don't have to uh, look for cans with film. And uh, I sometimes do many takes. Although, somehow, um, I do less takes now than I used to do in the past. Um, I simply realize that if uh, I can't get what I want in, let's say, 10 takes, there's no much point of flogging the dead horse. There's something must be wrong with the concept of the, of the shot, and I try to yeah. find a reason and uh, uh, modify it, and I start anew. So I think... My average is about uh, eight takes. Charlie, but you have to go. This is, again, one simple shot, and all is left to the actor and to the director of photography. It's all within the atmosphere of the room and the way Johnny delivers um, his lines. This is a very simple shot, and doesn't re require much. I can tell you uh, that I, when I come to the studio, I don't know how I'm going to deal with the scene and where I'm going to put the camera. Um, goes without saying that I don't use a storyboard. Uh, I used to, though, when I was doing my short movies, but then later I realized that it really... Uh, somehow cramped my style. Uh, I realized that doing storyboard of shots beforehand, I was forcing myself and actors to fit into something that no, n was not necessarily organic. Uh, being an actor myself, uh, I realized that uh, in order to get um, the right performances, right body movements, in order to have the actors taking the right body positions, sitting in right places and moving around in believable um, fashion, I have to start with them. So what I do first is a rehearsal and I see how it all functions and then I decide it how I'm going to film it. There is, however, um, um, a necessity of doing uh, very precise, um, very precise storyboard in scenes which involve special effects, where you uh, need the collaboration of, of a big crew and everything has to be prepared. In cases like that, I do a storyboard and most often I do it myself because I draw, I, 
went to an art school, so I don't have difficulties with it. But for a regular scene, like a couple of people talking or making love or fighting, I never storyboard. I didn't realize that this film is so long, I think I have to light myself a cigar to go through the second part of it. Uh, if we hopefully are halfway through it, that is. I avoid watching my films because most of the time I feel like I would like to improve certain things. In other moments I'm uh, straight ashamed of certain things that I did and yeah, it just doesn't do me any good to revisit this except for some very recent ones. Uh, like this one, for example, I still uh, don't have enough uh, perspective to see what I would like to do differently. Except that maybe here and there I would like to snap a bit of a scene. But uh, uh, there is no end to it. You can always try to improve and finally you're not improving, only having an illusion of doing it better, better often, it's the enemy of good. You're getting to like it. Very often, one shoots beautiful scenes that uh, don't go further than the cutting room. On this film, however, I ha hardly have any scene that uh, um, was totally eliminated. Parts of the scene were taken out, but uh, I was thinking of uh, including in this DVD the scenes not used in the picture, and I realized I don't have any. Hello, Gruber. Hello, Mr. Corso. Delighted to see you again. I'm always trying to be as concise in the movie as I can, and it's somehow always longer than I was anticipating. Thank you very much for assisting. This shot was quite difficult, starting on the detail like that. Uh, the actor had to show that there is something missing in this burned book, and that's not an easy, easy thing, and it was really... Uh, Johnny's acting that could uh, make it clear and I try to get him to make the audience understand that there is an illustration missing. Those inserts, all those close shots of the books were made much later about months or two after the film was completed. And the main difficulty in case like that lies in, the, in matching it with the rest of the scene so it just doesn't look like it's something uh, shot separately. And it took us a long time to get into it, uh, to get this uh, illustration, lighting, hands, which were not Johnny's hands anymore, you may notice it. If you look well, uh, um, match the rest. And we have many of those inserts that I don't remember, but I think about 50. We're now in the old French building which is totally abandoned. It's virtually a ruin and we had it uh, redecorated by Philippe Turlure and, uh, uh, and uh, Dean Tavularis. Uh, but it just does not, all this interior doesn't exist and all those books uh, were of course placed there. Well, I'm reassured, Baroness, because in my trade, to be spoken well of can be professionally disastrous. <sighs> Mike, 
this uh, baroness uh, is an English actress Barbara Jefford who replaced uh, uh, the originally cast uh, German uh, who was ill and uh, I must say she did a fantastic job because she learned all those pages of dialogue in uh, three days she landed over the weekend I think only an English actress is capable of it they have some knack for it maybe it's the experience they all do a lot of stage acting they a lot of um, the, uh, a lot of theater they're always on the road somewhere and they do films as well so they're tremendously disciplined and well-trained people and Barbara Jefford had to speak with a German accent on top of it. Uh, I know how difficult it is to jump into a, a movie like this and, and create a character. The fact that I started as an actor and I did a lot of stage and, and I did some movies helps me, of course, to understand their problems. And... Uh, when we realized that we had n no actress and we could not change the schedule for this scene, I was quite desperate and I called Barbara Jefford. I was literally begging her to do this role and she was very much afraid that she won't be capable of getting ready. I called her, I think, like four days before the shoot and she came right away to Paris and started working on it. Uh, so uh, uh, once again I can only say that I hardly imagine any other person doing it. its memory and preserve its secrets. The Order of the Silver Serpent. A sect? Kind of Originally, we thought of Hildegarde Kneft doing this role, and she she got pneumonia. So we um, quickly um, found a German actress who is a stage actress and uh, quite old. And she came to Paris, and after a couple of days, she said she won't be able to uh, learn all these lines in English, although she does stage work and, and learns pages and pages of text. It's in her language, but to do it in English, uh, she thought she w wouldn't be able to. So that's how desperate we were, because really we had no one for this part. Liana Telfer acquired the one in Toledo. Victor Fargus is an unbeliever. He's always refused to participate. So naturally, they use the Telfer copy. Not that it has ever worked. Did Andrew Telfer ever take part? Telfer? Oh, no, no. That creature, Liana, married him for his money. She comes from an old and aristocratic French family, the Saint Martins. But they were. This scene is um, one of the key scenes in the film because. Uh, the Baroness um, gives tremendous amount of information which makes us understand certain things which happened before and prepare us for certain things which are going to happen. So uh, th that's why there's so much dialogue here. Yet the dialogue had to be attractive, had to be witty and funny and, and um, interesting to listen to. Um, I'm not uh, very fond of long dialogue scenes and uh, um, this is one of the longest I think I ever did. It's also admirable to see Barbara Jefford's body language because she not only says all these lines but she's playing a cripple and uh, she's, she's got the stamp in, instead of the arm. That of course uh, it was again uh, done later, CGI, who did not really amputate her arm, which would be probably cheaper when you think of how much they charge for these special effects nowadays. Well, 
wait. Those CGI's helps us to achieve certain things which were not achievable before, but also, but at the same time, they took some fun of trying to struggle with special effects on the set and do it all uh, for real. It was somehow more fun than just sitting in front of a TV monitor and going back and forth and waiting for it to happen. Uh, in this scene again, uh, you will see uh, what we can do now with the computer, uh, the reflection that suddenly appears in the window, obliterating what happens outside at the end of the day. Uh, could hardly be done before, or probably with some incredible effort. I'm talking about this shot here when the light comes on. We had to combine two shots, of course. The shot that looks like a reflection of, of Johnny, which is what we see in the, in the uh, glass. It's not a real reflection. It's a shot of Johnny, a long shot from twice the distance. Uh, that means the distance to the window pane and from the window pane, and in an entirely different cafe because this cafe doesn't really exist. Uh, the shots uh, with Johnny in, in the foreground and the guy in the background are made on the on the street uh, with few cafe tables um, placed uh, in in front of him in perspective, but there is no cafe, the street is extremely narrow, and there was not even a locale that we could disguise for a cafe. I love shooting in the studio, but scenes like this one on the bank of the river cannot be done in the studio. Uh, there is just uh, too much space involved. It would have to be a, a, a gigantic set and we could not afford building something like that with water and all. So we shot it on the, on the real bank. Uh, we had to control traffic, light, bridges and everything in the back. And well, that was tough too. Besides, it was so incredibly cold that people were literally freezing and I didn't want it to show because the rest of the film does not have this type of uh, temperature visible on the screen. Of course, this um, scene had to be choreographed by a stunt uh, uh, director and, and Emmanuel Signer had to work on her spin kick uh, for a couple of months before that, she never did martial arts, but she did a lot of ballet, and that helps, of course. Uh, the movements um, are sometimes very similar, and uh, uh, she managed to do it herself. The river scene is also the first time that something uh, slightly supernatural happens, uh, and that's that, that flight over the stairs. And I wanted it to be sort of uh, uh, ambiguous, so the the spectators not not really certain that uh, uh, it really happened, and maybe she jumped, but at the same time he should know that she flies. And dozing it was the problem because it always looked either uh, too strange uh, or it was hardly noticeable. And finally, we got some kind of balance between two. So to get shot like this, you do it with wires, of course, and then you remove the wires uh, by the uh, CGI work. Put this against the back of your neck.
This scene is very important because that's where um, Johnny, or rather Corso, realizes that there's something weird or maybe unnatural about the girl because the flight on the stairs uh, is not a subjective shot. He doesn't see it. He sees it only here. There's something in her eyes uh, and all that, that changes and also the gesture of her putting blood on his um, forehead is somehow scary to him. This is uh, my favorite scene in this movie. And I must say that some, it was the right chemistry between these two actors. It was obvious from the beginning that one, they look well together, and two, that they work together well. And uh, um, there is not much happening here, and yet there is something uh, bizarre and sexy at the same time and threatening. And uh, um, what makes me happy that it's exactly the way it was described in the script. Yes? Anything new? It's always very difficult to um, instill the information at the proper rate, so that the audience knows more or less as much as the hero does. If, if the hero knows more than the audience, then you lose the audience because they, uh, they, 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 they can't follow anymore. And if the hero knows less than the audience, then he looks stupid. Uh, so the, one of the most difficult thing is uh, that balance here. And I always try to uh, outguess w how much is going to be clear. And I must admit that uh, mm, I'm not always uh, in the pace of, of audiences guessing. And then there is another problem. The audience, it's a big word. The individuals who get it right away and others uh, who need a drawing. So it's not a simple thing. I, of course, have some favorite movies that um, I, 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 I go back to. It doesn't necessarily mean that I uh, see them over and over again, but at least I think about them. And uh, there's one particular movie that I, uh, I saw when I was a, a boy of about 15 or 16, and that is Odd Man Out, uh, Carol Reed with... James Mason playing an Irish revolutionary. And that film had a, an atmosphere that uh, somehow uh, remains in every movie I'm, I made. All these scenes were made in the studio again, of course. I omitted to say, with the exception of the hotel lobby, which was made in a real hotel lobby with the street visible through the glass. And that was quite difficult to achieve because there are always great differences of uh, um, lighting on the street. Uh, sometimes a cloud comes and it throws off the balance between what's lit inside and the, um, the uh, light outside, uh, it's easy, of course, when it's one or two short. When, when you have to shoot the whole sequence, it can be tremendously difficult. Um, when we were um, shooting the studio, uh, things were, of course, much m more under control, but uh, when we were doing all those street shots and real hotels and uh, real interiors, um, it was difficult and we had to uh, travel 
uh, a lot as I said part of it was made in Spain and part in Portugal uh, there are parts which come later uh, which were done in south of France in the Pyrenees uh, luckily we started operating as a co-production as a French Spanish co-production uh, with the financement coming from an American company artisan and uh, the ninth gate was one of the first movies that that company produced now artisan is uh, well established and uh, practically famous uh, at that time it was a courageous decision on their part to undertake a film of such complexity and quite costly uh, to tell the truth because of all these um, locations uh, we hardly ever longer than one minute in, in one set we move from set to set from place to place and this is expensive in movie making so I may take an opportunity here to I thank this company for allowing me to make this movie and uh, uh, above all for not interfering artistically in doing it. So if you have any complaints you have to address the director and not those who backed him. It's also strange how the film is received in various countries. Um, when uh, the news came out that I'm doing a film with um, uh, with uh, Johnny Depp and then it's a thriller, uh, there was a great interest on the part of all distributors around the globe and they all um, uh, bought the picture. And when you look now at the career of this film, who now played practically everywhere in the world, uh, you have to look at the um, um, box office results, and it's puzzling sometimes why in certain countries the film does excellent business and in other countries fair. And there is no method and no analysis can give an answer to this uh, mystery. In my opinion, all three copies are genuine. But the fact remains, they display variation. Variations? If that were true, it would be a revelation. What makes you I think? don't read the reviews. Uh, they don't help me. Uh, what's important for me is the... Uh, reaction of certain people uh, whose word means a lot to me. And in this one, the man was hanging by the other leg. Here again, we back with Barbara Jeffert and back to these inserts and uh, when you think of it, you realize uh, how many of those inserts are in the film. Practically every scene goes close on a book or on the, on the illustration or the photocopy of an illustration. This is not Barbara Jefford's hand, for example. It was done, as I said, months later. We would not bring an actress from London to Paris to use her hand opening the book, of course. Nor are these hands of Johnny. And if you look close, you will see that, uh, that, that the hand in, in the insert is somehow younger. I must admit I'm impressed. This puts an entirely different complexion on the matter. You now when I'm through the cigar, I have to eat a piece of chocolate. 
to get some energy for the rest of this undertaking. My permission did not extend to that, Mr. Koto. One of the things that attracted me also to this novel was this puzzle of uh, uh, the engravings that um, reveals slowly the uh, enigma of the story and uh, uh, com comparing uh, the illustrations uh, had to have uh, a real sense and had to be very precise um, and that diagram that he um, draws and uses throughout the picture had to be conceived in such way that some nitpickers who watch DVDs or, or uh, cassettes back and forth and again uh, would be satisfied and uh, would not find any flaws in it. And I challenge anyone to uh, find any kind of lack of logic in it. And that reminds me, there was another thing that made me um, think of a scene in Rosemary's Baby, and that's that uh, first moment when he's in in that uh, Sintra place at Vargas's um, Quinta, putting two illustrations together and seeing that the keys are in different hands, uh, made me think of a moment in Rosemary's Baby when uh, she uses a scrabble to um, make an anagram of a name and starts discovering and understanding the mystery. And that's very similar. This is my favorite shot in the film when Johnny wakes up because he hears a, a strange noise and he discovers the Baroness in her wheelchair banging against the window pane. And uh, uh, I must say I like Barbara Jefford's face in this close-up with, with her tongue hanging over. It's very difficult to hold the tongue like this, so we made, a, we made an artificial tongue that she had in her mouth and then we uh, turn her eyes upside down um, by a computer effect. This is a real fire going there with some addition afterwards. Uh, here, of course, she's not burning, but her wig uh, was added. These are real oranges falling down on cue. But this one is an arc. This is a special effect. It's always difficult to shoot animals, and I hate scenes with animals and with little children. It takes forever, and that dog just didn't want to stand still for, for a few seconds. I was almost thinking of using a special effect for that thing but somehow we managed to grab a few seconds. And when you start editing, it's always shorter than you really think uh, you need. What I'm trying to say, that when you shoot a scene, you think you don't have enough stillness, and then when you put it together, you realize that half a second is plenty. 
I like this uh, cliche stuff of a, of a character chain smoking and drinking whiskey. That's like uh, Philip Marlowe or Sam Spade. And uh, uh, I like, as I said, uh, all these attributes that these characters have. This scene, sort of slow, sitting down, drinking whiskey and um, finding a rag on the floor would be absolutely unwatchable if not for the music that uh, gives it the dramatic uh, impact. And I must say that uh, I knew from the start that... Uh, Wojciech Killer would be the right composer for this uh, film. He's a guy uh, who studied in the same city I did. Uh, I studied the film school in, in Lodz in Poland and he studied music. But we never had an opportunity of working together until um, The Death in the Maiden, my previous picture. And when I decided to do the Ninth Gate, I sent him the first draft of the script and he immediately responded to it. And I knew that he was going to do something exciting. Uh, when we were recording music in Prague, uh, every number was a thrill. And I'm still very uh, happy and very proud of, uh, of uh, collaborating with him. Well, I, I learned my lesson, fortunately. I don't carry it around with me anymore. Otherwise, it might have gone up in smoke. Excellent. Good thinking. Well, with two copies gone, that seems to conclude your assignment. It only remains for you to return my book. I'm staying at the rate you can pick up your check. I attach great importance to the sound of the picture. It's as important as uh, the visual and the music plays the essential role in the soundtrack, of course. And to me, the music, it's uh, uh, the, the most important element of post-production. Some music can kill a picture. And I had films uh, that would I know would be much better have I had a better music, more talented composer. I was, in general, quite lucky. And I worked with some great uh, artists, uh, but uh, I uh, I was never so excited by putting the music under the picture in the cutting room as during the work on this one. You should know better by now. I must apologize for my young colleague, Mr. Corso. It was unpardonable. Is that her? When one edits before having the, the, the real score, one usually uses uh, the temp music. And sometimes you, you get used to it to the extent that when you replace it with a real score, you're sometimes disappointed. On this one, I never had such moments. Send this to Mr. Balkan at the Ritz. That's B A L K A N. Immediately. Certainly, sir. Always a pleasure to be of service. You coming? Having made several films here in France in the row, I of course started getting some collaborators that I uh, like to have on on my movies, and it became some kind of uh, almost a family. And it's easy to work with people who know what you want and who know your way of working. This is a real hotel, of course. Again, it's Hotel Plaza and a very famous hotel in Paris. And uh, uh, I live nearby, so it was fun to uh, just walk around the corner to work for at least a couple of days. And even these interiors are shot 
in this hotel this is not the studio shot This scene is uh, almost improvised by Johnny, his reaction to seeing these people. And uh, uh, the scenes that follows on the street were uh, shot with real traffic mixed with some of our cars. Seeing again some I of my old movies, it's really um, very difficult, with an exception of one or two. Uh, it's, of course, as I said, easier to see the last one. I think I didn't do enough movies. I waste too much time in between. Although I know whether it's really wasted time because I do theater as well. Uh, and it takes me a lot of time to um, to find a new subject. Now everything that follows here, the scene, it's naturally made with blue screen. And it wasn't easy because it's not just a little window uh, of a car. It's an um, open sports car when most of the uh, scene, scene are behind are taking the greater part of the screen. Some of it is not a uh, blue screen and it looks even more like a, a trick photography than the ones which are. Listen, we can't sit on their tail forever. They're bound to smell a rat. Here we had the problem because we overtake this uh, Rolls Royce. We saw the reflection of the camera car and then we had to remove it and put instead a little bit of red. Ridiculous. And same here, we saw the reflection of the camera in the car as we overtake it. And for this, uh, all this new technology is fabulous because it allows you to, to improve the shot afterward, which uh, before was not possible. All this was shot on a freeway near Paris, and we were lucky enough to uh, be shooting in the summer where uh, people are gone, and uh, there is relatively little traffic, and you can uh, get permission to shoot on this type of road. Otherwise, uh, it would be quite impossible. Every shot in this sequence is uh, uh, photographed at a different location and different time. This is made months later. Uh, this is how the movies are put together. Different um, moments a lot of time in between, so the great difficulty in uh, making a movie is to retain the continuity in your head and don't get um, distracted by uh, all these details that attract your attention during the shoot and trying to keep in your mind always the uh, uh, story and the continuity. The reflection is, of course, trick photography. This is the film where I 
used more uh, post-production tricks than any film before. Uh, it, it's simply that uh, it was required, but also because it was at my, at my disposal. Every year you have more uh, possibility to uh, improve certain things uh, in the post-production. Monsieur? Uh, Monsieur, maison de Madame de Saint-Martin. Le château, vous voulez dire? This is a village near Paris. Uh, we have a law here uh, which allow us uh, to go up to 50 kilometers from the uh, center without actually um, putting people up in hotels, etc. If you have to drive more than 50 kilometers, then it has to be treated as a location. This uh, castle, or rather chateau, is also within the 50 kilometers radius. So we would go there every morning. But it was, it was quite a long drive. That was not like shooting at the Hotel Plaza Atene next door. But uh, it was a pleasant drive. And less pleasant return home when you wrecked and would like to crash. Crash in bed, I mean. In France, you don't work such long days as you work in America. Uh, in America, you work sometimes 14 hours a day, and technicians here don't like that very much. But they compensated maybe with their ardor. And uh, uh, also, uh, the regular French hours are from 12 noon till uh, 8 o'clock without interruption. And that's quite good because when you stop for lunch, you lose the momentum. In France, we work nonstop uh, for eight hours, and then and then it's the extra time. So usually you work around ten hours here. Although on this film and this in this chateau, because we had to leave the place, we had sometimes very very long days or rather nights and i remember we worked once something like 16 or 18 hours or more and everybody was dead tired here in this sequence practically every shot has some kind of addition in it Those windows, for example, did not have what we see behind them, so we just put some blue and then, um, then added uh, whatever you see. This castle is uh, really ugly, in fact, uh, and uh, uh, the interior was not at all uh, suitable for our purpose, but we didn't have alternatives, so Dean Tavolaris again fixed it uh, for us with his crew, and, uh, and it's what it is. Each picture has a challenge, and uh, this one had two. I'd say on the production side was, as I said, going from place to place uh, and having so many uh, different sets. Uh, on the artistic side, it was making a film about the book. The book is virtually the central character of this movie. And that was quite exciting. So, 
Sorry to intrude on you like this. I, in general, uh, shoot the script the way it's written. Very seldom um, I change um, any uh, substantial things in it. However, in this one, um, the final scene, which we are going to see um, soon, the scene of the other castle where Balkan uh, sets fire on himself, uh, was not satisfactory in the script, and we all decided that we're going to improve this scene later. And um, on some long weekend, we had some three-day holiday or something like that, we sat down and we rewrote the scene and uh, enhance it to what it is now. And when we come to it, I'll uh, try to remember what was different. Don't kill them up here, you'll make a mess. Take them downstairs. You go first. And you. I like this um, expression that uh, Emmanuel Seigneur has in this shot as they walk down the corridor. It's very enigmatic. You don't know whether she, that smirk means that she knows better or wh you just don't know which way you should interpret her expression. Open the door. And then comes uh, the shot on these steep stairs, which was really very difficult to do because it was not a studio shot, it was real yeah. stairs, and we did it uh, with uh, uh, the Steadicam, and there was no place to put any lights. All I remember that we had great problems with having it done. I didn't know you had it in you. Octoportai ante cedunt serpentem quil verbum custodi. This is the same castle, still the interior of the castle you, th you have seen from outside, or the chateau, you we should say. Uh, and uh, as the first scene with many extras that we had in this film. It was uh, quite difficult because of lighting problems here. And in fact, I wanted to have a more mysterious uh, scene, but that in here it was incredibly difficult to render any more mysterious than it is in, in the final result. Uh, but extras were great. I, they loved uh, working on this scene, and they uh, they were delighted to be on this picture, so that made uh, the compensation. Mambo jumbo, mambo jumbo, mambo jumbo. Mambo In France, uh, we don't have the habit of doing the previews, and that's a great pity because previews can tell you sometimes a lot about um, the audience reception, and also um, you yourself watching the film with an anonymous audience discover things for yourself that you did not see at the previous screenings. But that's just not done here. Absolute power to determine my own destiny. You're insane, Boris. Give it back to me! Now you'll have a little bit of black humor, I think, the scene of this murder is uh, quite funny. I think the way um, Frank Langella uh, acted it is uh, hilarious and macabre at the same time. Particularly his expression when he's strangling Lena Olin 
I wonder how much of this black humor transpires. That depends, of course, on the spectator. I'm sure that some get it, other may not get it at all and may not even like it. But that's uh, the gamble one takes doing this type of subject and uh, trying to mix the irony, irony with, uh, 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 with macabre. When finally the picture comes out and it comes to the marketing uh, of it, I'm often consulted and it depends. Sometimes I'm quite involved in it, like in France, I must say, I was involved to a certain degree. Uh, sometimes uh, not at all. Uh, of course, it's uh, customary to present the director and the producer with the um, graphics of the uh, posters, etc. And uh, um, on this one I was. Sometimes I think that there are people who are much more competent than myself in marketing, so uh, I do not uh, interfere too much. Every film requires some reshoots. Mm, I didn't have on this film um, much of it, but there were shots that we had to come back to and do again. Usually some close-ups or detailed shots. This shot, for example, of uh, Emmanuel Seigneur with his fires behind was retaken because the first time we did it, it was not right. Uh, the, the sky on that uh, morning shots was also darkened because we could not shoot it at real dawn. Uh, so we had to do it at a cloudy day and then make it look like, like dawn. We were very lucky with finding that little river which was just um, below a dam and they were kind enough to adjust the level of the water to our requirements. So we asked them to just keep it like this so it will uh, cover the hub cups. All this scene was shot in a few hours. We had very uh, difficult time to reaching that place and Johnny was quite far away so he was brought on a set like a couple of hours before dark and we had to literally do uh, one take of each shot to get it in a can. Shooting on location is always competing with the, with the uh, w with weather and you never know in our climate here what is going to be in spite of the predictions. So uh, a, a shooting on location in, uh, in Mediterranean climate is very expensive because uh, uh, it takes just forever. Here that cafe, in fact, it's quite near Paris, although the rest of the location is the Pyrenees, the south of France. But it matched perfectly the, the style. I know that some directors uh, are very careful about uh, the choice of subjects, so it all will look good on the curriculum vitae, but I'm personally not uh, very much interested in it. I'm much more concerned with the uh, uh, excitement uh, and thrill that uh, working on a particular movie can bring me than 
uh, where would it plays in my biography. I make movies that I would like to see on the screen. I'm catering to my own desires, and it's all the choice of the subject that's a question of the moment, and I don't know why I have chosen a particular subject, uh, and how will will look, uh, how will I look when they add this to my curriculum. The ruins of the castle you are going to see in a moment are one of many uh, in this area. There are several most fabulous uh, ruins uh, of castles built in the 11th, 12th century by the people called the Qatars, who were exterminated by, by French. They had religious differences and wars, uh, which left this beautiful architecture, some poetry and some art, and nothing else of these forgotten people. There's hardly anything left for the just stones and the interior of uh, of this tower is naturally shot in the studio. So this is the last shot on location, the one when where Corso walks uh, along that uh, balcony. My films are so often analyzed by people or critics or whatever. Uh, truly, when I'm on the set, I don't think of all these references. I just go by instinct, and I enjoy working on the set. That's the part of movie making which I like the most, working with the actors, uh, with the uh, crew, and trying to s find solutions for daily problems. When one starts the movie, there's always this decision to be made, what kind of ratio you're going to use. And I remember discussions we had with, uh, with Darius Conji and finally uh, thinking of the scenes and of uh, the movie itself, we thought that uh, it has to be widescreen. And uh, I don't know, it's very difficult to really um, verbalize the... Uh, uh, motivation uh, for this final decision how the film is going to be photographed. I know that uh, Darius was uh, insisting on, on this ratio. We thought we needed great depth of focus and light camera for doing this movie. But they happen to be mine, not yours. You know something, Corso? In spite of our differences, I have a soft spot for you. I'm touched. We have something in common, you and I. We share the same passion. You've developed the same obsession, haven't you? Unfortunately for you, no. only one of us is destined to fulfill it. You're out of your depth. Can't let go. I'm not leaving here empty-handed. Don't even think about it. Now, here comes the scene which was uh, rewritten uh, in the middle of the shoot. Uh, in our original script, we didn't have that hall into which they both fall, and we didn't have this scene with Johnny being imprisoned by this uh, situation and watching him from this uncomfortable position and also going through the floor uh, to save himself. This scene was quite different. And I'm uh, quite happy that we decided to uh, rewrite it. I'm entering uncharted territory, taking the road that leads to equality. This book, um, as I said, it's so complex. It's a very um, erudite book, making a lot of references to uh, literature, um, it has uh, two main plots and many subplots, and they all uh, interweave. 
uh, to extract it was uh, quite difficult to give it a structure that uh, could be photographed uh, and turn into a two hour plus movie was a challenge in itself. Uh, and it was uh, very difficult to uh, get a conclusion because um, the book sort of dissolves and uh, um, we had great problems with the ending and I don't even know whether I'm satisfied with the way uh, we decided to go. But that was the best of all alternatives, I think. I love uh, Frank Langella's acting in this scene, uh, a real possessed madman. Uh, in, there's one shot where we almost burned him, at least the end of his nose was burned, and we all got the scare and Frank particularly, more than anybody else because he was in the middle of the circle. But naturally, a lot of flames uh, here were added afterwards. This entire scene was um, made uh, by uh, Sony Image Works. All fire was added by them, and Scott Anderson, uh, the guy who uh, was responsible for all this. But all other scenes, or at least uh, um, many other scenes, were made by a French uh, company called Dubois. And we had to share, uh, to make them share the work because uh, it required so much time that we would have never been ready if it was only one. Uh, outfit doing everything. The guy burning is of course a stuntman. Now, outside, all the fire and all tricks on this one were made by this French company, Dubois. It does terrific work, as a matter of fact, and I worked with them already on other things. Working with actors, uh, it's so different from case to case. Uh, they are different people, they have different personalities, different approach, different character. And each time you work with a new actor, you have to uh, find a way of collaborating with him. With Johnny, it's very easy because he's got uh, a knack for it, for saying lines in such a way that I always sound right, there's never a false note, and it's quite simple. Uh, there is uh, not much talk and motivation. Other actors keep asking you questions. Johnny hardly ever asks anything. Well, for those who don't get it all, I'm I may say a few words about the character of the girl in the film, which c clearly represents the devil, uh, even if it's not the devil itself, she's at, at least his messenger. But uh, she can be interpreted as the devil 
who takes uh, appearance which is more uh, suitable for uh, the work he, he has to do. And Johnny, who plays the character who stars as a, a complete mercenary and ends up uh, totally involved in, in the mystery that he's trying to solve and greed in getting the access uh, to the unknown. But uh, I'm not going to explain the film. There's a great difference between French and American actors. I think uh, American actors are, are more disciplined in general. Uh, I think, as I said, the English actors are still more disciplined and more experienced because they do a lot of stage work. Uh, practically all of them. Uh, whereas American actors, those who make movies hardly uh, do any theatre. Um, French, even less. There are some great actors here, but I must say um, they uh, uh, don't they, ha they don't have the same training that um, Americans have. Many American actors believe in method acting and actor studio, and I'm very fond of this type of acting. This is again our pro Spanish production manager playing two roles. And that's much closer to what he looks in his real life without the, the, the white wig and moustache. And this, uh, this final effect, it's again made by Dubois. I should say that the, uh, the uh, titles are also made by the same company. This is a special effect too. And this is an insert which turns into a special effect. And that's all I can say about this picture, except that I think that soprano that sings under the uh, and titles is one of the great voices we have now here in Europe, even if she is a Korean girl. And uh, you should watch out for her. There is no better way of seeing a movie than in a theater with an anonymous audience around you who participate in the experience. That's cinema. That's something that uh, it's so deep in human nature uh, that it may always exist, these gatherings starting from the Greek theater or Roman uh, circus or... Uh, medieval passions or, or rock concerts, you know. But uh, next to it is watching the movie at home. And I'm so happy this DVD was invented because uh, VHS, it's such a poor quality that uh, uh, for me, it was impossible to 
uh, watch movies at home. Uh, I was only watching them on laser discs, and those were huge and heavy and clumsy and did not have enough information on it. Now, watching on the DVD is a real thrill. Well, this was quite an experience for me. Uh, <clears throat> my voice is hoarse. <clears throat> I don't think that cigar helped and chocolate even less. But it was an experience and I hope I wasn't too boring to you guys. <laughs>